Both of us. Both of you? Okay. And who all else are you interviewing? We've interviewed Sam Massell, her father. Um, sure. We just came from A.J. Robinson, uh, Central Atlanta Progress, uh, John Portman. Tom Johnson. Tom Johnson. Oh, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. Bob Hope from the Braves. Mm -hmm. My old Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Valerie Jackson. Um, Valerie, that's... Uh, Maynard's Maynard's widow. widow. I, I like her a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. And this is going to be no more than a half an hour. It is. God, I can't even think that okay. it'd be more than ten minutes. <laughs> well, we or five minutes. We want to talk to you about your what you want people to know about your impact on Atlanta, because we. Well, that that's you. Know, you to get other people to do that. Well, we want, yeah, we want. I don't, I don't want to talk about what I did. I'm, okay. you know, I've talked enough about that. Well, just you know, yeah, the, the questions ask, you have, right? The questions, just why? So, CNN. Are we? Are we started Atlanta, now? We're starting okay, now. You CNN. Got it. Why Atlanta? You know, why do a news network and why do it in Atlanta? Well, it's because I was here. And. What about all the disadvantages of doing? Weren't there disadvantages to being in Atlanta? Yes, as far as uh, as far as CNN was concerned, there mm -hmm. was. I, I I can't think of uh, maybe with the Braves, I'd done better with the Yankees, but uh, but uh, I think the disadvantages were were minor. For instance, uh, it probably would have been better from a media perspective to have been located in New York because mm -hmm. all the other news networks were in New York and they had you know the, the big stories they were they 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 were there because we had a big New York bureau but being here you know gave us kind of a it did give us a southern slant mm -hmm. uh, and we might some people might have looked at us as country boys uh, but then, on the other hand, it costs less to operate in Atlanta than it would have in New York, uh, with high union contracts and everything. So, so there were advantages and disadvantages uh, as far as CNN being located here. And uh, I figured it would it would cost less to to do it here, and I was right. Mm -hmm. And that was really important because we didn't have hardly any money when we we didn't have adequate resources to do CNN we did it on a wing and a prayer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and being here I'm sure made made it somewhat easier because the costs were considerably less than they would have been in New York mm -hmm. but the, was there any special feeling about having that southern presence in Atlanta or well I thought it would be good for one of the news networks and they were NBC, CBS, and ABC, mm -hmm. that, that our being here, we would give a more middle America perspective uh, because of our location than the elite, elitist New Yorkers. And was it, did you have any sense of bringing something to Atlanta? I mean, did you, what, of? Well, I, you know, I, I did, brought a lot of things to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do it to, to bring things to Atlanta. I wasn't mm -hmm. working for the Chamber of Commerce. I, mm -hmm. I did it because I was here. Mm -hmm. I liked Atlanta, mm -hmm. and I felt familiar. It was Atlanta has been my home. Mm -hmm. the, but nothing. I mean, there were no disadvantages that would move you. That would have said we need to just move this someplace else. I, I, I did say. I said, you know, when, when we were criticized for starting in Atlanta, and I said. You know, I said uh, General Motors is in Detroit, Procter and Gamble's in uh, in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and I said uh, Coca Cola's in Atlanta. Why, 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 why do you have to be in New York? You know, other big successful leading businesses have been located outside of New York. Mm -hmm. Do you think you, the way that you were able to sort of build and layer your businesses was there was did Atlanta facilitate that, or you? Do you think any place you would have been, you could have done the things that you did? 
pretty much. But you know, like everybody's got to be somewhere, mm -hmm. and I was here. If I had, I, 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 if I had been living in St. Louis or Chicago, I certainly wouldn't have just moved here to 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 to, 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 to do C, CNN. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, I was here because I was here. Yeah. I did choose Atlanta. You know, I I, I I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Lived mm -hmm. there till I was nine. My father moved to Savannah, Georgia. He sent me to Georgia Military Academy, which is now Woodward Academy, out at East Point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to school there for a year. Then he sent me to... Uh, Macaulay School in Chattanooga, and I went to school there for six years. So I didn't really get to Atlanta until I was 23 years old, right before he passed away. Mm -hmm. it, he, he had a billboard company here he purchased, and I worked worked there. So that's how, that's how I got here. And when I got here at 23, except for a couple of years of changing my residence to Florida, uh, I've been here ever since. And the and even with the billboard company, you you work to stay to keep that big company here in Atlanta. The, yeah, there was no yeah. reason to move it anywhere. Still, you were coming to a city that had been built around transportation, and you added communications. Do you see a common thread in the city's history as a transportation center, and now? moving it into the 21st century as a global communication center? Well, Atlanta was large enough to have the infrastructure to support uh, the kind of communications company that we built. It was real small to start with and and uh, and, 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 it, and, it, and it grew and it grew as Atlanta grew. I don't think it was necessarily, but we, we might have contributed a little bit to the growth of Atlanta with uh, keeping the Braves here. The Braves were uh, in danger of leaving because of lack of support. They weren't doing well. And uh, we got the attendance up and firmly established them here. But obviously we didn't firm, firmly establish the Hawks because they are – no, I'm, I didn't mean the Hawks, the uh, hockey team. But the hockey team had already left uh, the Flames had before I got in the sports business in a big way. Your primary attention was on the Hawks and the Braves? Yeah, because they were better television products. Okay. Not many people don't like to watch hockey on TV very much. I mean, there's some people watch it, but it doesn't have the... And quite frankly, basketball doesn't have the television interest that uh, that baseball does. One of the comments that Bob Hope made was the importance of that first All-Star game here in Atlanta. What are your recollections of that event? And he described it as sort of a change in the All-Star event. Which part of that? Time? I don't remember. I mean, I remember we had the All Star game here, and it was exciting and a chance to showcase Hank Aaron and his accomplishments. And With the what was what were your impressions, sort of, of the politics of Atlanta, and how much were were you involved in in some? Well, of the Well, in the early days. Maynard Jackson, when I bought the Braves, before before I bought the Braves, I didn't really have a whole lot of uh, contact with the city government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got along fine. I obeyed the laws and never got in any trouble. Um, but when I bought the Braves, I wanted to televise all the games. And the city was underwriting the losses of the stadium, the uh, mortgage and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I, in order to get permission to uh, televise the home games, which could have impacted uh, 
attendance and, and made the city situation worse. I, I offered to uh, to uh, say, hold the city whole from any losses on the Braves for any reason, mm -hmm. to the best of my recollection. And so that helped the city. And of course, Maynard really liked that. And some of the, the city councilmen did too. I got to know know them. I made presentations before them. And then when we bought the Hawks, we did the same thing. We the the, the, the uh, Omni, which was the building before Phillips Arena, was losing money. I think. Anyway, the, the Hawks were costing the city some money, and I held them harmless from the Hawks. Uh, in return for being allowed to televise home games. And uh, and my relations, I would say, with Maynard and, uh, and and the preceding mayors after that, trying to remember the one that got in a little bit of trouble. Campbell. Yeah. I, I got along fine with him. And I got along fine with your dad. Well, I, obviously is on the board of the United Nations Foundation when he's the first man, one of the first people that I picked to be on the on the on the board. He had all the right experience, you know, particularly having been ambassador to the United Nations, as well as congressman, as well as mayor. When did when did you first get to know him? I can't remember where I first met him. Mm -hmm. Or do you, was do you remember anything? Um, I I, I mem memory memory impaired a little uh -huh. bit, so uh -huh. my memory is not normal. Or anything stand out? Any stories? Any experiences with? Well, I've uh, always had pleasant dealings with your with your dad, but I had pleasant dealings with everybody. Uh -huh. I mean, you look check around, and I don't think you can find. To find anybody in the city that said I, that Turner did something, just screw them or mm -hmm. take advantage of them. Do you do you, is that? Do you think that's something that is true generally in the business community here of people pretty much being straight dealers? As far as my, to the best of my recollection. Uh, most everybody we dealt with, or everybody that that, that, that I can remember dealing with, uh, dealt fairly and honestly with with me, and I with them. If that wasn't just true in Atlanta. That was mm -hmm. true everywhere I went. That was true with the Russians and the Chinese and the Communists and the Cubans and Fidel Castro and mm -hmm. you name it. I just got along with everybody. My philosophy is treat everyone with respect, dignity, and friendliness. And if you do that, you'll have a lot of friends and very few enemies. It's hard to make enemies if you do that. There's nothing to be enemies about. Tell us a little bit about the Goodwill Games and your efforts to promote uh, international relations with that event. Well, I was concerned about the boycotts. You know, first uh, Carter boycotted the uh, the Olympics in Moscow. I think that was probably his biggest mistake. And I think he thinks so too. Or one of them. He's a dear friend of mine. Um, and then the Russians retaliated as usually you do in a cold war or even a hot war, it retaliated by boycotting the Los Angeles Olympics, which came next. And it had been 12 years since the two countries, the Cold Warriors, had uh, even had a major athletic event in common. And that's why I came up with the idea, let, let's see, see uh, that I would uh, propose, a, a, I proposed a partnership with the Soviet Union, where we split the costs. And we had to have three Soviet agencies had to be involved. One was the government to, to prove it. Number two was the sports committee, their equivalent of the Olympic Committee, that, that they would want to do it and, because they were going to have to put it on. And 
26 events in 15 different venues from swimming, track and field, boxing, r rowing, sailing. Anyway, so this, we had the, the sports committee degree. Then we had to also get the cooperation of the television network that was going to televise the games. They had it, it takes a hundred cameras to televise an Olympics, or because you have to have cameras and three, you can four cameras in three or four in thirty different locations, and uh, maybe that's a little heavy, but the, the, you get the, the general idea. And, and we, 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 we made a partnership with all three of them, and uh, we, it was a 50-50 partnership. There was a, a capitalist American private company par partnered with a communist Soviet Union, and uh, we said, what, what are we going to do? We had a discussion. What are we going to do if we dis have a disagreement? Since, we, since we're 50-50 partners, how will we break the disagreement? And we thought, I said, is there an arbitration, an international arbitration panel anywhere? And we found out there is one in Sweden. And we contacted them and asked them if they would uh, to go, you know, uh, uh, referee if we had a disagreement. And they said, yes, they would for a fee. And we never, never had to go to them, but we had that as a, as a backup. That was smart to think of that, because if we had had a disagreement, how would we have, how would we have resolved it? I mean, we would have, and, and, and then on top of that, because it was 1985, just after the, the boycott, and I wanted to have the games in 86, I think it was, it was 86, less than a year away. And the only way that we could have possibly done that, that they could have had the, is they had done the Olympics uh, only two years before, and they had all the facilities all ready to go. They had to dust them off a little bit, but they had the facilities and they had had the infrastructure, so they could do it in 11 months. Even put together a uh, incredible, you can look at it if you want to, uh, opening ceremony that involved 50,000 people uh, you know, performing at the uh, opening ceremony in the 50,000, it might have been 70,000, I don't know. But the stadium was full of people in uniform dancing around and... What else you want to know? I can talk about the Goodwill Games for a long time. I'd like to know. I can talk about the Braves for a long time. <laughs> They're both great topics. Well, how would you s assess the impact of the Goodwill Games? I think it helped end the Cold War. Just like I think that uh, Nixon sending the ping pong team to China helped uh, uh, end the war between China and the United States. Remember that? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I'll tell you what, it costs a lot less to bring a ping pong team over <laughs> than it does to bring hundreds of athletes in 27 sports. What could we do with Iran? <laughs> Baseball? Soccer? <laughs> Soccer? Um, let's talk a little bit about the Braves. You increased attendance. Attendance increased. Okay. Attendance increased. Through some very creative marketing and your own personal involvement. I remember when you went... Well, that was Bob Hope was the one that thought all that stuff up. He, he, he really... He was perfectly uh, cast for that role. He got you in uniform to manage them that evening? No, I did that on my own, <laughs> I think. But the net result was to help. But he did the ostrich races and all the other stuff. I remember those. <laughs> I too. Pushing the baseball from first place to first base to home plate. Push it? With a nose. Oh. <laughs> Down your hands and knees. Now my face was all bloody. I would have had an advantage there. <laughs> was did you have an interest in owning the team before? No. Did you put it on the air? No. I I I I, I was televising the games, and I was worried that uh, the Braves were going to move to Toronto, and I wouldn't have any team to to televise. And I had didn't I, I had no way of knowing how I could buy the Braves. I was at the stadium. Uh, it was the 
last one of the last games of the season, and there were about 600 people in the stands. I mean, there was just hmm. nobody there. The Braves were 30 games out, 25, <laughs> and they were losing by five or six runs, and it was 10 o'clock at night. Dan Donahue, who who was the owner's representative of the of the Braves and the general manager, he was running the club, president of the Braves. Uh, he he was wandering around like a lost soul in the stadium, and I I, I was sitting there by myself, and uh, I said I sat down by him or he sat down by me and we sat down together and I said what, what are we going to do with this with this team I mean the, 30 games out uh, nobody there he said I don't know what you're going to do Ted but I, he said I know what we're going to do I said what are you going to do he said we're going to sell the team and I said who are you going to sell it to he said to you <laughs> I said, to me, I can't afford the team. I said, uh, how, how much is it losing? He said, about a million dollars a year. I said, holy smoke, a million dollars was like a billion, million dollars a year. And, and, and I said, well, how much, do you, how much do, you, do, you, do, you, do you want for the team? He said, $10 million. I said, you want me to pay $10 million for something that's losing a million dollars a year. He said, that's right. I said, how, how do you justify that? He said, baseball teams sell for a certain price no matter how bad their financial statements are. And he said, this is a reasonable price. And uh, I said, well, not for me it isn't. I went home, when I got in bed that night, I tossed and turned and I could see the headlines in the newspaper saying Braves go to Toronto. Toronto was looking for a team then. They didn't have a baseball team. And I said, if that were to happen, I'd be lost. I said, if I did buy the team, then I could maybe improve it. Maybe I could improve it. I certainly couldn't do any worse because they were in last place. So I went back the next morning, and, or a couple of days I thought about it, and then I, I made them an offer that I, I, I couldn't come up with $10 million, but that I'd give them $10 million, a million down, and ten years to pay over the rest, a million a year for ten years. And uh, they accepted it. And uh, baseball business. So you enjoyed that though? So you can talk about them all day? Mm -hmm. You enjoyed the baseball business? What was I going to do? Be miserable? <laughs> I mean, that, all they needed was a miserable owner. I had to be enthusiastic about it. I, I, I figured I'd better you know, I remember the damn Yankees, the movie, you know, mm -hmm. you got to have heart. All you really need is heart. Oh, it's fine to be a genius, of course, but keep that old horse before the cart. When your luck is batting zero, bump, 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 get your chin up off the floor. Mister, you can be a hero. You can open any door. There's nothing to it but to do it. You got to have heart. So I figured that was my theme song. I went out there and rolled up my sleeves and put on the uniform and was bat boy. I did, I did everything, pushed that ball with my nose. There's photographs of my bloody face. It was supposed to push it on the grass and I hit it real hard with my head and it rolled over into the base path, which is gravel. Mm -hmm. So from there on I had to push push it with my nose in the gravel and I had to push it hard because Tug McGraw who was 20 years younger than me was pushing the we were having a race and he was going from third base to home and I beat him by about six feet well it was a big deal because no owner in history to my knowledge had ever pushed a baseball from first base to home with a bloody face have you got, but we got a picture of that book. How hard, hard, be, hard would it be to get? The, the picture of that? Yeah, the, 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 it's on the cover of the magazine. Mm -hmm. got, uh, I mean, not, not magazine, the cut, cut of the book. You know, it's a photograph of me standing there with a big smile with the blood pouring off. Well, I actually have pictures I think the book was I, Take Me Out to the Ball. If you have the actual photograph. The actual photograph. Okay, okay. Either get that or the, yeah. or the book. Sure. So I threw myself into it. I went to just about every game from then on for 20 years. 
And at the time, I didn't even know what the infield fly rule was. When I bought the Hawks a few months later, also for $10 million, a million down, I didn't know what the three-second violation was. But I learned. But that seems to be your, have, gotta have heart seems to be your theme song generally. Yeah. That you always, you take what you have and you put everything into it. That's right. Well, I just, it's hard to be a success without doing that mm -hmm. at anything. Do you continue to enjoy Atlanta as a place to do business, as uh, headquarters? I live here. Montana Grill and all your I other... I live here. This is my home. This is my, I live right upstairs. I've been living downtown for 20 years. I lived on top of the Omni for 10 years, and I've lived here for 12 years. Yes. Oh, they're getting it? Yes. So... The um, living downtown Atlanta because you just like the downtown. Well, I was at work. Or? It saved me an hour a day, a half hour commute to home, and a half hour commute back. So that gave me, and particularly, I worked down here till six o'clock at night, and then I went over to the stadium and shook hands for a thousand people or whatever, and I had lunch, dinner over there, and I watched the game, and I came home and. And, and for, for 10 years, I, or close to 10 years, I, I spent the night on my couch. I lived in, the, in my office. And then I finally built a little penthouse on the roof, 700 square feet, and I, I lived there for 10 years. Jane and I, Jane Fund and I, when we were married, lived there. It, it's still there, the little penthouse. They used it for a storage room. I was the only resident of downtown Atlanta that wasn't homeless. <laughs> Are you glad to see some of the changes in downtown with more people living downtown? Yeah. It saves, I'm a big guy, environmentalist and the work, work hard on the glo global climate change thing and the less you drive, uh, the better you are, the less electricity you use the less energy. Where does that come from, the environmental concern? I've always been concerned about the environment. Mm -hmm. It's all we have. Mm -hmm. We lose the environment, which it's all over. But it's, but, you know, the South is kind of a, you know, we've got unlimited everything sort of attitude. Yeah, we also got unlimited danger. But in terms of why you saw why you saw that difference, the the importance of the environment. I mean, what do you think? I you I see? saw it when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. No, I read. I, I just the natural world. That's why I like bison so much. Is that they came so close to extinction back in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. We killed them from 30 million down to 200. Almost lost them. So what would you say to new business leaders in Atlanta about keeping... How do you get to be a new business leader? Uh, okay. What would I say? Mm -hmm. Good luck. But with any, any sort of words of wisdom or what things advice? that they should keep? Well, I get asked advice? that question in, in right. ten words or less. Right. Or early to bed, words. early to rise work like hell, and advertise. You started with a billboard company. <laughs> That's right. You made the billboard bigger and connected it all over the world. With CNN. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you're still here. You're still making Atlanta home. You got the Tess Montana Grill headquartered here. Kept Phillips Arena here. I mean, Where's that picture? Uh, she, getting, we had to, she had to run downstairs with the archives. To okay. So, how many, because how many businesses have yeah, you started did. in Atlanta? It's like. Oh, I don't know. The uh, seven television networks. Or more. Restaurant chain. 
I didn't start the Braves. Mm -hmm. Well, you saved them. them. Right. Yeah. Hawks. I brought the, I, I did bring the, the uh, Thrashers here, the hockey team that like, went for Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. I brought them here and I named them and Thrashers after the Georgia State Bird. Mm -hmm. Brown Thrasher. And Atlanta used to be called Thrashersville too before it was Atlanta. Mm. At least that's what I read on a plaque in front of what used to be the Atlanta Journal building. That was cousin John Thrasher who lived there. Had a log cabin there. And after the birds, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you what, what what do you think or remember about the um, racial climate in Atlanta, the relationship between particularly the black and white community for a southern Well I never had I, I, I grew up my first nine years were in Cincinnati and I went to a public school that was segregated and half my classmates were black and half were white. So it seemed like perfectly normal to me. I didn't know any different. I, I lived in a neighborhood that was a mixed neighborhood. Uh, we were very modest means at that time. And we just lived with everybody else. And I got along, got along fine. I never had, uh, I, when we got down here, I couldn't understand the segregation. But I was only 10, 11 years old. I, I, I was really too young to be an activist. And by the time I got in my early 20s, I was working like a dog in my father's company. And I didn't really uh, have time or any, Nobody asked me. I, I didn't get involved in the civil rights movement. That, of, of all the things in my life that I regret, I would have liked to have gotten involved. Uh, I would have liked to march. I have marched. I marched with the women's, the million women's march in Washington in the front row, and I really enjoyed it. I, I think that I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. if I can sure. Add, uh, you also made sure to uh, to hire. A lot of oh, oh yeah, and, and yeah. I, I treated, yeah. I, I, Bill, Bill Lucas of, of the Braves. I promoted him to general manager, and he was the first black general manager of any of the professional sports. And it was like you weren't really intentionally doing that. Did it because he was the best man for the job. <laughs> and I had a, uh, we had my father's captain of his boat was a black man and he was like a second father to me when I was nine, ten years old and we stayed together my whole life till he passed away about five years ago. His name was Jimmy Brown and uh, he was like family so I, I never had I never had, had or did anything racist ever. I think everyone recognizes that professional sports has played an important role in helping whites and blacks come together and cheer for a common team that featured African-American stars. It wasn't just professional sports, sports. Hmm. But at a time when colleges were still segregated by and large, professional sports sort of led the way in some right. sense. But about they, they, they integrated about the same time. Having Hank Aaron certainly helped. Um, his incredible strength. Yeah, I hired him back. He was he was gone. He was in Milwaukee. Yeah, that made no sense. Hmm? That made no sense. But they still do that. They still get they still get rid of the players that are identified with the team. Not always. Dominique mm -hmm. Wilkins stayed with the Hawks. Yeah. I mean, you you took a different approach. Right. It seems like some... And I, I hired Henry. I said, Henry, would you like to buy a job with the Braves? I said, you deserve it after all your contributions. He said, I'd like to be minor league director. I said, you got it. Yeah. That was... Uh, well, he's, he's an Atlanta treasure. I know. That we but if it hadn't been for me, he might not have even been here. Right. Yeah, but we got him back. Future. 
Yeah. You want to ask the. Well, it's always what. What do you see for the for the future of Atlanta? I hope we don't run out of water. Uh, and for 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 me, uh, I think we generally put too much emphasis on growth, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Atlanta has been driven by incredible growth. I think when I got here 60 years ago, the population was about 1 billion, and what is it now, about 8? Yeah, coming up on 6. Coming on 6? For the immediate Metropolitan majority. area. Mm -hmm. That's enough growth as far as I'm concerned. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with the size of Atlanta. I know there are a lot of people who like to see it get bigger because they can sell more lots. And, but I think the quality of life here, the bigger a city gets, the more quality of life deteriorates. Atlanta's big enough. But I'm not trying to slow it down either. Mm -hmm. Any words of wisdom to future scholars looking at our city's history and the people who shaped it? Um, well, that's a good place to uh, grow up, be educated, raise a family. It's, you know, it's everything. We've got it all here. Television stations and sports. Yep, but they're everywhere. The weather's good too. Keep the water supply and right the air and all the other things. <laughs> I did that. Wow. Deliberately so I could win. <laughs> you haven't seen it, have you? It busted my nose, my. But I got some cheers because the owner got down there on his hands and knees. Yeah. You don't have a picture of me pushing the ball. I forgot to ask for that. Yeah, we just luckily we found this. <laughs> Ducky found that, right? We've got them all archived, put away. I understand. Great. All done? This has been great. We really appreciate it. Okay, well, it's it. my pleasure. We really appreciate it. What are you going to do with this? We're we're doing a book about Atlanta. So um, it's it's going to be a book? It'll be a book. It'll be a documentary. So we'll come back with my dad at some point to try to get a couple of these, quote, these quotes on video. Okay. And um, we are also using this as an archive for Georgia State so that they can continue to kind of look at Atlanta what has uh, and learn from what we've done and what good to see you great to see you too if you see your dad before I do tell him I said hi I sure will okay I sure will appreciate it so much you bet yes, indeed. nice Thank to you meet so you so much good to meet you as well you bet